Chapter 10 Summary in the Handbook of Healthcare Delivery Systems. This chapter was originally written by Hari Balasubaramanin, Brian T. Denton, and Quimin Lin. And finally, the textbook, after several chapters of reasonably vague and high-level boring concepts, is moving into more concrete, practical suggestions on how we can improve performance and processes in healthcare. This chapter addresses the issue of patient wait times for primary care appointments, specifically looking at the size of a physician practice panel and the effects on queue length. To start, there's an introduction on the concept of timeliness. This is crucial in primary care. When patients are unable to get a timely appointment, they may delay care or they may seek care in the emergency room. And when they pursue care outside of their own primary care practitioner, they incur higher resource utilization because the person treating them may be unfamiliar with their medical history or their personal preferences, leading to higher testing. The chapter quotes a statistic showing one in three patients identifying the inability to get a timely appointment as, quote, a significant obstacle to care, end quotation. And for those who live in Canada, I suspect the number is actually considerably higher, given the lamentations my friends uh, tell me about how much trouble they have getting an appointment. Tied with timeliness is the concept of the continuity of care. Continuity is important because it leads to higher patient satisfaction, increased medication compliance, improved diagnoses, and reduced hospitalizations. But in order for patients to have continuity of care, meaning that they're seeing the same primary care physician, they require a timely medical appointment, which brings us to the concept of appointment scheduling. Appointments can be generally divided into those which are acute and urgent and those which are non-urgent. And the traditional scheduling technique was to book non-urgent appointments into the distant future and schedule urgent appointments sooner. Inevitably, one arrives at a steady state where there is no longer room to schedule an urgent appointment in a timely manner, and even the urgent appointments now get scheduled into the far future. This situation of a steady state of untimely appointments is, in my opinion, also known as the Canadian healthcare system. As a means to work against this trend, to having difficulty scheduling appointments, there has been a new push towards advanced access or open access. This system of booking patients tries to allow any patient who calls the clinic to achieve a same-day visit. It's the idea of doing today's work today, no matter if the patient's matter is urgent or non-urgent. In order to provide open access, it is important to study the effect of a physician panel on the patient queue. A physician panel is the number of patients that a physician has in their practice. Typically, this is between 1,500 and 2,000 patients. And the patients that they have are not all identical. There's a concept of case mix or patient classification. And this is important because some patients in this physician panel may have higher levels of complexity and some have lower levels of complexity. Some require more appointments, some require less appointments. Some require appointments which are typically more urgent and some when they require an appointment, it's less urgent. And if you're developing a simulation, you can incorporate other factors such as age, gender, and history of their past appointment urgency. This chapter looks at the concept of case mix or patient classification as a means to help with their model on patient Q. But the concept of case mix is often considered in understanding reimbursement. Typically, physicians want a nice, healthy a number of healthy young patients in their practice in order to offset the potentially more sick and complicated elderly patients, which will take up more time. And of course, for those people who are more cynical, 
primary care practitioners who are looking to make a lot of money will often move to healthy young urban neighborhoods where you are unlikely to have to encounter sick elderly patients, which will affect your, quote, case mix. Anyway, getting back to the chapter, this chapter goes on to model the effects of a physician panel size on the patient queue. It assumes that a primary care physician can see a maximum of 120 patients a week. This number is derived from the reimbursement in the United States for primary care appointments at 20-minute increments. And it optimistically assumes that the physician is going to work eight hours a day for five days a week, meaning 24 appointments daily. And they say this is optimistic because in the course of a physician's workday, they have many other tasks other than direct seeing patients, such as responding to phone calls, responding to labs, reviewing results, writing uh, letters and notes in the patient chart. Now, the interesting thing is that as the panel size increases, the length of the wait list increases non-linearly, meaning at a more exponential growth rate. For instance, if a physician has a panel size of 1,200 patients, there is a 99.4% chance that the physician will be able to see less than 120 patients that week. The reason that this is just an estimate is because the model that the chapter uses ends up having a mean, a standard deviation, and a curve each week as they assume that the number of patients who phone the clinic on a daily basis is not consistent each day, but averages out over time. As the panel size increases to 1,400 patients, there's still a 94% chance that the expected number of weekly visits for a primary care physician will be less than 120. But the moment you get to 1,600 patients in the panel, that probability that you can have less than 120 visits that week is only 60%. By the time that you have 1,800 patients, the probability that you'll have less than 120 visits that week reduces to 5%. And if you have a panel size of 2,000 patients, which is not uncommon, the chance that you will have less than 120 visits that week is 0.36%, essentially meaning that patient queues are inevitable. And as we've seen, the increase from 1,600 patients in the panel and a probability of 60% drops down to 5% at a panel of 1,800 and 0.3% at a panel of 2,000. Now, you'll also remember that most physicians have panel sizes between 1,500 and 2,000 patients, which means that inevitably, this exponential Q growth is a natural phenomenon in most physician practices. This is really an optimization problem, and one of the tweaks you can do is you can move the solo practitioner into a group practice and run the model and simulation using that. And by running a simulation where the individual patient has the option to see a different practitioner when they make a call, if their practitioner's slate is full for the day, can dramatically reduce both the wait time and the total number of redirections that a patient has to go through when their primary care physician is occupied. One of the other counterintuitive things about patient cues is that the rate of no-shows actually increases as the patient queue increases. Some may think that patients who had been waiting longer would be more likely to show up to clinic, for reasons which aren't articulated in the chapter, as the patient queue lengthens, the chance that a patient doesn't show increases. Perhaps they forgot about the appointment, perhaps they no longer required it. But regardless, this leads to a situation where you have long backlogs and low clinic utilization, two really negative factors at once. Looking into the future, the chapter mentions two emerging trends in primary care. The first is on team care, 
And this results really out of necessity in the United States. Because the salary of primary care physicians is less than that of specialists, many medical school graduates no longer pursue a career in primary care in the U.S., which has led to significant shortages of primary care physicians, as we've discussed elsewhere in the other chapters. Because of the shortage, new models have emerged to provide primary care. This incorporates physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical assistants, licensed practical nurses, patient appointment coordinators, and receptionists, all helping in the care of a patient. And so team care is going to be an emerging trend in primary care. And the effect on queuing should be favorable, as we mentioned earlier, that when you run simulations with the effects of a patient being able to be cared for by a group of practitioners, wait times ultimately drop. The second trend is on the patient-centered medical home, the PCMH. And th- this model, the chapter says, is designed specifically to reduce fragmentation in a patient's care. And so the primary care physician and his or her practice becomes the center of a patient's care, and they remain in the loop as the patient receives care elsewhere in the healthcare system. The patient-centered medical home will also incorporate non-physician caregivers and non-face-to-face encounters. But even after reading this part in the chapter and looking at some of the patient-centered medical home websites, it's still very unclear to me how the patient-centered medical home differs from a well-run primary care practice. Anyway, that is chapter 10 on patient cues. Essentially, as the patient panel increases for a physician, you get an exponential increase in the length of the patient queue with a concurrent increased no-show rates, and all this leads to breakdown in timeliness that a patient can receive an appointment, leading to breakdown in continuity of care, leading to poor quality of care and increased costs because of the problems of appointment scheduling. Open access is the proposed model on how to resolve this. And potentially the way to mitigate and resolve this is the introduction of open access or advanced access booking models combined with group practices and team care.